3D printing, is this all there is? Of course not. So, in this video, we will have a shootout between three advanced 3D printing technologies. Stepping into the ring for five rounds of testing a multi jet fusion from HP, high speed sintering from Voxel Jet, and selective laser sintering. Multi jet confusion and high speed something? Don't worry, we'll run through how these systems work and how they differ to a perhaps more familiar 3D printing technology, FDM or FFF. So, FFF offers low cost access to 3D printing, the systems are available in different sizes, and the range of materials is pretty good decorative filaments to apex polymers. These advantages do come with a trade-off. Surface finish, for example. While post-processing options exist, hot off the print bed, your part will likely look like it has been 3D printed. Yes, that means layer lines. Also, if you're printing in an environment subject to standard gravity, then your prints will need supports. Removing these supports? That leaves marks on the points they intersect with your model. Throwing away supports in the bin? That's dolphin food. Bad. Okay, so perhaps aesthetics are, heaven forbid, unimportant. Instead, functional parts are the focus, for example, a component that can withstand certain stresses. To understand how the mechanical strength of 3D printed parts varies between additive technologies, it's useful to understand a little about anisotropic versus isotropic materials. 3D printing differs from 2D printing, or just printing as people not in our industry call it, with the addition of a third axis, X, Y and Z, or Z. Anisotropy means a material's physical properties vary depending on the direction in which they are measured. Wood, graphite, ice, reinforced concrete, muscle fibers, and FDM 3D printed parts are all examples of anisotropic materials. Property, for example, tensile strength, conductivity, or refractive index is the same in all directions, and it can be said to be isotropic for that property. Glass, most polymers, diamonds, and many metals are isotropic. 3D printed parts made on an FDM system are generally weaker in the third axis or the Z layer. Research shows the weakest layer is half the tensile strength of X and Y. To summarize, FFF is relatively low cost with a trade-off in terms of speed and its low resolution leading to surface quality and possibly mechanical properties. ASTM defines seven additive manufacturing Manufacturing methods. These include vat polymerization, binder jetting, directed energy deposition, and of course material extrusion. The most common example of the latter being FDM or FFF. The most recent four year stats show that the use of polymer powder overtook poly photopolymer resin. So, in this video, we're looking at three powder based 3D printed processes high speed sintering, HSS. Multi-jet fusion, MJF, and selective laser sintering, SLS. All three methods use powder materials. The difference is in the binding process. SLS is a powder bed fusion additive process. The laser sinters powder material in a heated build chamber. Layer by layer, the part is built up. After each layer is lasered, a recoater system, maybe a blade or a roller, spreads another thin layer of fresh powder, and the process repeats. Binder jetting, at its most fundamental, uses a powder-based material and an ink. In common with PBF, the powder is spread by a roller over the build platform. However, instead of a laser, a printhead jets the binder where it is required. If you want more details, follow the link in below to our engineering report. Both methods are support free. The unbound or unsintered powder surrounding the 3D print serves as a support. To an extent, this powder can be reused in future builds. Both methods are fast and can produce parts with a high resolution. And perhaps most importantly for industrial applications, both methods can produce parts with improved mechanical properties. Improved mechanical properties, what does that really mean? If you've seen our previous videos, then you know that means we need to put such statements to the test. Mechanical performance. For this test, we took a total of 15 tensile test dog bones, remember them, for each technology. Five printed along the x-axis, five along the y-axis, and five along the z-axis. Each 3D printed in PA12 and tested under ISO 527 standards. First, to determine which tech produces the strongest parts, we look at the average ultimate tensile strength, or UTS. This is the maximum pulling stress a part can withstand before breaking. For this round, it was SLS that printed the highest strength specimens on average. Next up is the Young's modulus, which is the measure of tensile stiffness. 
A higher Young's modulus means a stiffer part that deforms only slightly under elastic loads, whereas a lower Young's modulus corresponds to a more elastic part that's flexible under load. This time around, it was HSS that yielded the stiffest parts. Finally, we have the elongation of break, which is a measure of ductility. The measurement shows how much a part can be stretched as a percentage of its original length before it fractures. Interestingly, in the XY plane, it was SLS that printed the most ductile parts, followed by MGF and HSS. However, in the Z-plane, MGF produces the most ductile parts, followed by SLS and then HSS. Next up, we compare the dimensional precision of each 3D printing technology. To do this, we took four metrology scans of four different part geometries. We compared these 12 scans, four prints in three technologies, for parts to the original STL files, which allowed us to calculate the deviation and inaccuracies of the prints across various points across their surfaces. The 3D scanner used was the GOM Atos 2 400, which is precise to plus minus 30 microns. Looking at the metrology data, it's the four SLS printed parts that are the most precise overall, seeing as their actual dimensions were the closest to the expected dimensions of the STL models. The mean alone doesn't tell the whole story, however. Looking at the standard deviation values of the dimensional inaccuracies, SLS had the highest spread than MJS followed by HSS. So, while SLS printed parts dimensions will on average be truer to size, our test showed that the HSS process offers the greatest consistency and repeatability. To put this into context, we'll take a closer look at one of the four geometries, a support bracket, which is shown on screen. The bounds on the bell curves define where 99.6% of the points are located. For example, 99.6% of the dimensions 3D printed via SLS are within these intended values. For MJF, the figures are slightly different. And finally, for HSS, 99.6% of the printed dimensions are within these values. It's interesting to note that the vast majority of the HSS and MGF parts dimensions were smaller than their intended values, as opposed to being larger. This can be attributed to the heating step inherent to these 3D printed methods whereby polymer parts are sintered and fused using an infrared lamp to increase density and strength. This unfortunately has the effect of shrinking parts, so it's a good idea to scale the dimensions of a build-up during print preparation to counteract this effect. To further evaluate the printing capabilities of the free processors, we evaluated several physical 3D printed benchmarking tests. The first of these tests was a set of three torture cubes printed in PA12, which we had the pleasure of assembling. The design comprises several smaller cubes, each with common 3D printed features such as lattice geometry or a moving gear system. The torture cube is a dynamic print test with a plethora of moving components, meaning that it provides a great way to determine the differences in the surface quality between the three technologies. In this case, we looked at how easy the assembly process was for each of the cubes, the overall fluidity of the cube's movements, and the detail resolution between the three technologies. When it was time to assemble the HSS torture cube, the first six faces all clipped in without much force at all. The corner pieces which required sliding rather than clipping were a little more difficult to slot into place due to friction, with some of them calling for the use of a screwdriver. As for the 3D printed features, the HSS cube's ball and socket joint didn't work. The hinge worked, um, but it was stiff and the spring worked perfectly. We encountered too much friction for the gear system to move at all. While the large cube itself did rotate, albeit with some resistance. Looking closer at the more intricate cube elements, we noticed that the HSS parts were cleanest in terms of residual powder. In fact, we couldn't find any loose powder in the cavities of the lattice geometries, so no additional post-processing was necessary. Next up, we assembled the SLS torture cube. This time around, we faced more difficulty with the six clipping faces due to the presence of excess powder in the joints. However, thanks to the smoother surface texture offered by the SLS, the sliding corner cubes were easier to assemble without as much friction. Looking at the 3D printed features, the ball and socket joint did not work. The hinge did not work, but the spring worked just fine. Again, there was simply too much surface-to-surface -surface bonding for the gear system to move at all, but the larger cube assembly was as smooth as can be. Overall, we were impressed with the fluidity of the wider SLS assembly as it's the easiest to rotate. Due to the presence of small volumes of residual nylon powder in the lattice structures, we had to conduct some minor additional post-processing on the SLS build. This involved blowing out the cavities and manually shaking out the cube elements before assembly. Finally, we assembled the MJF torture cube. 
Much like the HSS print, the first six faces clipped in with ease, but the relative rough surface texture meant sliding corner pieces required some significant elbow grease. Interestingly, the 3D printed features on this cube offered the best functionality of the three. The MJF assembly was the only one that had a working ball and socket joint. It had the smoothest hinge movement and the spring bounced back as expected. However, the gear system failed to move again owing to the grainy texture and unintentional bonding of the MGF surfaces. The ease of rotation was similar to that of the HSS build. Much like the SLS cubes, we found small volumes of residual powder in the individual elements. Again, we had to perform some additional depowdering before assembling the MGF build. Specifically, we had to blow out the cavities and shake out the powder. When all was said and done, we could see that the HSS and MGF 3D printed cubes were noticeably grainier than their SLS counterparts leading to rough surface textures. In the case of the MGF cubes, we could see the layer lines, meaning the HSS and SLF prints offered the best surface quality overall. If we compare identical cubes between the three technologies, we notice that HSS offers the best detail resolution, delivering the finest edges, sharpest corners, and cleanest thin walls. Moving down, the SLS counterparts begin to get a little fuzzier, losing their sharpness and crispness somewhat. Finally, it's the MGF variants that are the most visually blunt. To supplement the review, service providers also sent us four different industrial part designs, 3D printed in PA12. Each of the models was 3D printed three times, once via HSS, SLS and MJF. Following parts include a tubing element, a suspension prototype, a support bracket and a general benchmarking model featuring sets of holes and towers. Much like the torch cubes, these 3D printed parts allow us to qualitatively assess the performance of the three processes. Looking at a tubing element, a support bracket and suspension prototype, we once again see that the SLS process is capable of achieving the smoothest surface quality. Similarly, the MJF parts were the only ones where layer lines were visible with the naked eye and Voxeljet's HSS 3D printer sat somewhere in the middle. From 3D printed benchmarking models, we could see that the HSS variant definitely had the finest geometric grooves and clearest writing. A testament to the process, and suggesting that grain size really is more important than DPI when it comes to detail resolution. The SLS part was the only one to successfully fabricate all the towers, however, with HSS and MJF missing the thinnest spike. Interestingly, the holes on the MJF and SLS builds were printed as true circles, how they should be, whereas the HSS process yielded holes that were closer to ovals. However, HSS once again also delivered the finest edges and sharpest corners, while SLS and MJF were noticeably blunter. How much does it cost for manufacturers to actually employ these polymer 3D printing technologies in their day-to-day -day operations? To answer this, we looked towards several 3D printed service providers. To compare the pricing of HSS, MJF and SLS, we requested instant quotes for four different 3D printable parts. We selected nylon PA12 as a material and averaged the quotes to provide a comprehensive pricing profile for each process. Interestingly, it was HSS 3D printing that turned out to be the most cost-effective with an average part price of €15.82. MJF followed with an average part cost of €23.89, while SLS proved to be the least cost-effective with an average cost of €27.50. Owing to the similarity of the technologies, HSS and MJF are actually similarly priced when considering initial costs, but there are several factors that ultimately make HSS more cost-effective. First of all, the size of the Voxeljet VX1000 HSS allows for larger batches of parts to be printed, which reduces the cost per part in series production. HSS also makes use of uh, just a single absorber fluid, whereas MJF relies on two fluids. This difference in material consumption further impacts running costs. As far as applications go, both HSS and MJF provide a viable route to both functional prototyping and low-stress end-use production in sectors such as automotive and consumer goods. Use cases include electronics housings, connectors, brackets, covers, wiring clips, manufacturing guides, and ducting. On the other hand, SLS, while pricier, lends itself to higher strength parts and is the only one of the three capable of processing high-performance engineering polymers like Peak. As such, those in the market for high-strength end-use components will want to pay a premium to ensure that they're getting the mechanical properties that they need for the job. So, which of the polymer 3D printing technologies should you go for? Like many things in life, the answer is, it depends. Inkjet technologies like HSS and MJF aren't going to beat out SLS when it comes to part strength. 
But if you're operating on a budget and the components in question won't be under extreme loads, HSS might just be for you. Interestingly, our testing also suggests that HSS lends itself to high stiffness parts, whereas MJF offers greater ductility and elasticity, even when using identical materials. As such, HSS may be best used when deflection in a part needs to be minimized, while MJF should be employed in situations where bending and flexibility are required. When it comes to dimensional precision, laser-based SLS 3D printing trumps both inject-based processes, but it's HSS that exhibits the greatest repeatability. Again, this will depend on the use case, but for many series production applications, repeatability is crucial in ensuring product reliability and meeting certain end quality goals. Ultimately, we suggest conducting a comprehensive evaluation of costs, lead times, materials choices, and mechanical property requirements for specific parts and applications before opting for any one 3D printing technology.